So say, hey, anything that is good here, just send them an email, say, praise, that's good. Everything that is bad, just take out your tomatoes and send them to me. Um, also something that has been kind of a, 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 a driven force behind the latest things that we have been trying to uh, collect is that we, we really want, the, I'm a blind man, I'm a blind man a transition, although this is bipolar disorder, but I, I really want to connect back to the physics. So I'm working with experimental physicists, try to do this connection between the theory, the model, the math, and everything in between. So uh, I'm going to show a lot of experiment by David Hall. I'm his, I'm, I'm his college in the East Coast of the United States, and I'm also working with uh, some other groups, uh, Leche group with Daniele San Vito on polaritonic condensates. Uh, we have worked with Peter Engels at Washington State, and also with Brian Anderson in Arizona. Um, so the talk is going to uh, start with a just a very brief introduction and set up of, of our equations. Um, I'm going to then show you the motivation, the actual experiments from David Hall's experiment. And these are going to show uh, in two flavors. So I'm going to uh, give you uh, one set of rounds that are with vortices of uh, uh, opposite charge, two vortices of opposite charge, and then uh, vortices of the same charge. So it's going to be very interesting dynamics and swing from this uh, system. And hopefully we'll be able to uh, tie the dynamic system aspect after all the reductions back to the experiment. And I'm going to also say something about kind of the 3D extension of some of these results, also trying to do some sort of particle reduction, uh, and always comparing with uh, full numerics as well. All right, so this is our beloved equation, beautiful equation for the applied math people. Uh, this is great because we have a nonlinear equation. Experimentalists can uh, basically do almost anything you want with the external potential. They can even tune the nonlinearity to be positive to negative or being large or being small. So there is a lot of freedom to actually do very cool stuff with uh, this model that predicts pretty much uh, condensates very close to temperature equal to zero. So disclosure, do not ask me anything about finite temperature. There is no finite temperature. I'm at temperature zero, uh, at least the experiments are in a way that we're close enough to zero to neglect the thermal fraction. I'm going to concentrate on a repulsive uh <coughs> condensate where we have a harmonic trap that's going to have two uh, strengths, the radial strength and the Zeke strength. And by playing with these two strengths, we can actually do a 2D uh, scenario pancake trap by doing this trapping ra uh, strength to be larger than the radial trapping strength. Or we can also have these two uh, frequencies or trap strength to be close to each other to have a bulk of 3D uh, BEC. So we're going to concentrate on these two regimes. Okay. So without further ado, well, a little bit of a propaganda, shameless propaganda. I like to advertise the dark book. We call it dark because we do dark structures because we're doing repulsive, so dark solitons, uh, vortex rings, and all that stuff. And we chose a dark cover for the dark book with me and the other two amigos. Uh, so let me show you the experiments. Uh, so this is not particularly new. This is dates back to 10 years ago or so. But I thought that this is going to be a nice audience to show you all these three back from experiments to theory to numerics and back and forth. Um, so what happens if you put just a single vortex in a trap? You have that the vortex processes. That's what you're going to see here. Uh, this is a rubidium uh, condensate uh, with around 10 to the 6 atoms. Uh, the vortex core here seems to be pretty large. You have to keep in mind that these are uh, images after expansion. So before the expansion, the vortex core is really thin, maybe a hundredth of the Thomas Fermi radius. So the image here looks like a very, very big blob of the vortex. The vortex is really much thinner than that. This is just the pr pr procedure coming from uh, the imaging. In this case, uh, the uh, experimental apparatus, they combine a imaging technique where part of the population through rabbi coupling can be sent to another hyperfine state. 
that hyperfine state is then imaged and destroyed, so you are left with part of the imprint, 97%, 98% of the atoms. You let them run. Again, you transfer with rubber coupling with the other hyperfine, then you photograph, and with that you can actually do kind of in situ imaging with a whopping amount of kind of eight frames. So I'm gonna show you here eight frames of a movie, not of starting the same system and letting it run a bit longer. It's actually the same system after each snapshot, I just removed two or three percent of the atoms, so I'm assuming that this is not affecting too much the condensate uh, on all the dynamics of the vortices, and you will see very nicely the vortex rotating around the center of the track. This is very well known, very well studied, uh, so it's uh, an, 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 an understood from uh, many directions. What So here there are not particles, there is particle because there is only one vortex. Uh, the bosons, I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm doing here already mean field. Uh, I'm gonna do mean field, but this, sure, sure, I'm gonna do mean field in the end. So I don't really care about that. Uh, I can tell you that here you have 10 to the six atoms and you're talking about the in to sample to be of the order of microns. Tens of microns or hundreds of microns. This is about a million particles, and this is about 100 microns. That will give you an idea of the, of the densities. Hmm? The core of the vortex is artificially enhanced because of the image uh, technique, as I said before. The core of the vortex is really much thinner than this. The healing length will be of the order of one micron, where this uh, thermal radius is around 100. So do not take this for granted. This is after expansion. So what happens if instead of having just one jumping beam, I have two jumping beams? Um, the experiments, by the way, they don't have, at least at that time, they don't have a controllable way to put any number of vortices, any sign of vortexes at any position. So what they're doing is, well, they were using <coughs> this quenching through the kibbutz Zurek mechanism, and they were creating some vortices. So sometimes we had one, sometimes we had two, sometimes we have three. I don't know if they were plus one or minus one, or one, one, and one, or one. We didn't know, okay? So this is just two vortices. I don't know what sign they are, but they are there. They take eight pictures, and this is what we see. We see nothing, kind of a steady state. So whatever was there, some interactions with the vortex and the trap, the vortex working in direction, everything got kind of canceled, or something went wrong, but they're not moving. That's pretty nice, like a steady state, as I said, because they did not where they were not able in the experiment to really prepare the sample. We had a bazillion of these runs, so we just grab another one and see what happens with another run. So this is the, uh, the stationary uh, two vortex configuration. And they also had movies that look like this. So this is kind of re reminiscent from uh, Lucas' talk. Seems to be kind of a steady state that it's uh, neutrally stable. That's the one that we saw in the first movie. And then somehow, if I perturb this in a kind of a symmetric way, I'm gonna get kind of a periodic orbit. So I'm getting the periodic orbit that is nothing but the perturbation around a, a neutrally stable steady state. Okay, all right. The things, and this is just the, the all the things overlaid, the things get a little bit more complicated, a little more, more interesting, and we get this, uh, type of scenario. So again, I'm starting with two. I want you to notice this angle, the inclination of the line of sight between the two vortices. And as I go by, they're gonna start rotating as before, but there's gonna be an extra ingredient. You see that now the line is around here. So it seems to have kind of two frequencies associated with this steady state or in this orbit. One will be kind of a frequency that has to do with the rotation around the steady state, and then kind of a rigid body rotation as well, okay? So kind of a quasi-periodic orbit maybe by having this frequency and this frequency to be in commensurate to each other, maybe this is a quasi-periodic orbit, okay? So and this is type of the uh, orbit that um, we, were, um, we were given from the experimentalist. 
This is a completely circular trap. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the elliptic trap. I have a lot of things that I could say about the elliptic trap. Uh, I might mention a little bit about the elliptic in a second. This is completely circular. Uh, the ellipticity changes things quite a bit. I mentioned that in, in, in a few minutes. I'm going to say a little bit about that next. OK, so let's try to put things into pen and paper and do some crunching of equations. We know how uh, vortices process in a trap. They basically process with a frequency that it's uh, I denote here as WPR0. That's the precession rate at the center of the trap. And as you get away from the trap, because the um, vortex is going to feel its mirror image through the boundary, as the vortex gets closer to the boundary, there's going to be a Im mirror image here that is going to affect the dynamics. And as you can see, the frequency is adjusted by the relative distance from the Thomas Fermi radius, the edge of the trap, RTF, so that as I get closer to the edge, the vortex starts spinning faster and faster and faster. This ingredient here is really important because without this ingredient, we will not get the, the very cute bifurcation that I'm going to show you in a few minutes. It will be very boring because it's just linear motion. Here you have this correction that gives you the juice to do beautiful uh, bifurcations out of the system. All right. This number. Yeah. This is well known. I'm just kind of brushing the, the details uh, under, the, under the rug a little bit. So it could be thought of as the density gradient here, or it could be thought of that and the combination with the mirror image. So it, it's, it's your choice. It's not too strict because in the mirror image, is if you have a cloud that is like this and you have a sharp corner, that's when you use the mirror image. Uh, you, you know, I think you will get something different. And then you, th th there are some fudges that you can actually do to the model. In fact, this model is not perfect. If you put here a constant, you can actually get it uh, even, even, even better. It depends on what pro approach you, you're getting. So uh, this is not universal. The shape, the functional shape is kind of universal, but there are certain corrections depending if you do uh, perturbation theory, if you do asymptotic theory, if you do images and all that. It's just about the frequency getting larger as you go in this direction. You will get qualitatively what you need to get the bifurcation. Somehow they balance with this. Yes. Yes. But you almost run out of questions with the previous speakers. Well, as you can see here, there is the S. I forgot to mention what the S is. S is the charge of the guy. So if it's a plus vortex, it's going to rotate in one direction. If it's a minus vortex, it's going to rotate in the other direction. The previous one? I don't know. I haven't checked that yet. We will see. Okay. So uh, let me give the other ingredients. I already gave the ingredient of what the trap does to the vortex, the precession. And then you have the typical scenario where you have a plus and a minus. They just run parallel to th each other. If you have a plus and a plus, they rotate around the third. Minus and minus, they go in the opposite direction. Uh, this is also well known. Uh, there are many methods, again, to obtain what the uh, orbital uh, frequency of these two uh, vortices is. Uh, okay, But um, if we believe that, <coughs> and I, I will talk more about it later, that the dynamics is mainly driven by the phase. If the two vortices are far away from each other, basically the density gradients that one vortex imposes on the other vortex are basically null because the healing length or the width of a vortex is pretty thin. So as long as they are very far away from each other, far away, let's say, 10 healing length or so, the only contribution is going to come through the phase. Therefore, the uh, speed at which two vortices are going to interact 
through the gradient of the phase is just going to be basically proportional to 1 over the separation between the two vortices. Again, uh, a very standard result. So you can write an equation of motion for two vortices independent of what their sign is. You just put here what the vorticity is for the vortex 2. And this is the uh, velocity that vortex 1 feels because of the presence of vortex 2. Vortex 1 has coordinates x1 and x2, and the other one has coordinates um, x2 and y2. So let me just do this picture because we're going to see this later. So suppose that you have the vortex 1 here with coordinates x1, y1, and then another vortex here, 2, x2, y2. Okay. Therefore, using this um, prescription of the vortex-vortex interaction and the precession, we can add many vortices, for example, or we can add also all the vortices and also the trap. In here, I have my master equation that takes into, acca into account precession and all the different vortex-vortex interactions. Keep in mind, again, that this WPR is proportional to WPR0, that is the frequency of precession here, with a term on the denominator that depends also on the distance, okay? So this term also have x1, y1, and x2, and y2 in it, okay? The coordinates of the vortices. Uh, nice enough, this system has conserved quantities. It's a Hamiltonian uh, ODE or set of ODEs. You can actually prove that there are two conserved quantities. Uh, one is associated with the total energy, the Hamiltonian, and the other one with the angular momentum. And just from a dynamical perspective, if you have n vortices, you're going to have two n equations minus two conserved quantities. That means that you're going to have two n minus two degrees of freedom. That will tell you how many vortices you need in order to get inter interesting stuff, right? So if uh, my effective no number of degrees of freedom is 2n minus 2. If I have now two vortices, then my effective degrees of freedom is 2. Therefore, I'm going to get something that is boring. At most, I'm going to get two periods, maybe quasi-periodic orbits. I will need at least three vortices to get something that is pretty interesting, chaos or, or whatnot. Pablo? Linear momentum is broken because I'm in a trap. So there is no translation, there is no translational invariant. In fact, coming back to your question, this is where I can answer a little bit about your question. If the trap is not circular but it's elliptic, you eliminate the possibility of conservation of angular momentum. So basically your new degrees of freedom is basically 2n minus 1. So even two vortices can get you very interesting stuff if you have an elliptical trap. Follow up? It's good. It's good. If you're not sure, don't ask. Just wait. <laughs> All right. So we have this 2n degrees of freedom system where we can just use our normal dynamical systems tools to study uh, what are the different states. For example, what happens if I have a plus and a minus vortex configuration? That's basically what we saw before. So you were asking if there were plus and minus. This, this is actually a plus and a minus. <coughs> <coughs> you can actually find, for those differential equations that I showed you before, you can find a stationary steady state. That stationary steady state has a specific equilibrium distance. That equilibrium distance can be understood pretty easily. So let's uh, do the trap here. Let's do a plus here. So this plus, just because of rotation, is going to rotate, or precession, is going to rotate quite fast because it's close to the boundary. On the other hand, I'm going to have, on this side, I'm going to have a minus. This minus is going to rotate on the opposite side with the same strength. Okay? And now with respect to the vortex-vortex interaction, this minus is going to affect the plus, and it's going to just go in this direction, but small because the distance is large. This plus it's going to affect the minus in the other direction after turning. So you're going to get this. So overall, you're going to get more push towards one side. On the contrary, if now you're close to each other, like this, now you're going to have that the precession is going to be smaller. 
So this is going to happen sex. The other one is going to happen sex. But now the vortex, vortex interaction is going to be much stronger. So you see that somewhere here in the middle, these forces, and I say forces because this is a first order equation. They are not Newtonian type of equations. So I heard before in some of the talks, we, I mean, we have done it, you have done it, some of the speakers, you say forces. They are not really forces, they are velocities, right? So these forces will balance at a specific location, and that specific location can be given in terms of the original parameters for equation. You can actually compute the uh, frequencies, the linear frequency around this neutrally stable point. You can actually make try to make a match of those frequencies you have them here in terms of the original parameters of my system. I can even match them with experiments. I'm not going to show you the result, but we actually match these uh, these uh, rotational frequencies with experiment really nicely just using linear theory. That's why I was telling Luca that if you just look at these orbits, these orbits, although they are just linear orbits, they can tell you a lot about the actual nonlinear orbit. Even the frequency will be not that far away. So you can even predict from the equations what is going to be the frequency. So we're talking about what is this sound. If you can measure the sound, the background sound, just by linearizing, you will actually get that linear frequency of what these little will be on the background, just by linearizing around the, the, the steady states. Uh -huh. Are you a fortune teller or something? Did you see my slides? Because in five slides or so, you will see what you're saying. All right, so <coughs> this guy is good. Yeah, so this is now what uh, other uh, orbits are, the ones that you said that they are have two frequencies, one frequency, another frequency. So you see uh, these type of runs. So this seems to be just one of these perturbations around a, uh, a neutrally stable state plus an extra rotation. If you notice, the distance of this vortex to the center and the distance from this vortex to the center is not symmetric. That might be interesting. If I just do a symmetric perturbation away from the equilibrium, I might actually rotate like this. But what happens if I just do something that is asymmetric? That might actually give rise to these uh, two different frequencies. And the experimentalists sent us these pictures, and they could not make up too much about what they were seeing here. Okay? We will see exactly what these pictures mean in just a second. So this suggests that I should be looking for a stationary steady state, asymmetric from the center, on a co-rotating frame. And that's what I do here. I'm just going to set up one vortex and the other vortex, diametrically opposed. Each one has its distance from the origin, and both of them are rotating with the same frequency. You put that into the ODEs, you can find a steady state. Again, remember, this is steady state in a co-rotating frame with frequency omega orb. So you can actually find that steady state. And that steady state is given for R1 and R2 values that solve this equation. You can also do the linear stability analysis out of this co-rotating stationary state to get this frequency. So now I have omega orb that is given depending on R1 and R2. I will get omega orb, this overall rigid ro body rotation. And the linearization around the fixed point will give me this small frequency of precession. So I will get exactly both of these frequencies out of the theory. And uh, therefore, the generic motion for the plus and the minus, it's, uh, it's like an ep epitrochoid. Epitrochoids are curves that roll on other curves. So it is like a circle rolling on another circle. So now that we had these pictures, I can extract all the parameters. In this case, the parameters will be the initial conditions. So by taking out the initial conditions, I could compute omega orb and then place these figures that they were on the lab frame, put it in the omega orb frame. And once I put them in the omega orb frame, you see exactly what's going on. This is an asymmetric orbit, but very weakly asymmetric, so it's rotating very slowly. So omega orb is small, and this one is much highly, uh, 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 much more asymmetric, so it's rotating faster. This is asymmetric in the other direction, so it's rotating in the opposite direction. But these pictures that seem to be, at least these two, could not make too much heads or tails of them from the experiment, 
after we just place ourselves in the right reference frame, we can understand exactly what this could just pass. Okay? So this is the plus minus scenario. Again, because experimenters can produce these things at nauseum and have bazillion of these figures, they send me more, and there were other type of uh, dynamics being observed. In this case, what happens if you have a plus and a plus, for example? Same charge vortices. The issue with having same charge vortices is that all the contributions, the vortex trap, vortex trap, and the vortex vortex interactions, they're all going to be pointing in the same direction. So there is no way to balance the forces. So the best choice that I have is to at least do something in a co-rotating frame, okay? Because I have a non-zero net angular momentum, so the whole thing is rotating. So let me start by trying to find stationary steady state in a co-rotating frame in the case of a plus plus. So for that, I just go to polar coordinates. So I'm going to get that each vortex is going to be a certain distance away, a certain angle from the horizontal. In fact because I want to be in a co-rotating frame. Let's just look at the relative angle between the two, and I have a beautiful dynamical system, again, for the radius and the relative angle between these two beasts, for which I can do my usual tricks of dynamical systems. Find fixed points, linearize, look for bifurcation, etc. So it turns out that there are steady states for any uh, R1 equals to R2, because all these little arrows, if the distance between the two vortices is the same from the center, they're going to be the same length, the, the same length. therefore I'm just going to have a co-rotating state. But instead of just looking at this uh, co-rotating, well, <coughs> sorry, I look at this co-rotating state, and then I can perform stability analysis. So I'm going to perturb away from the uh, ra radial distance and also from the angular, um, the uh, relative angles between the two, and I get a a nice equation, in this case it's a second order equation, so it's an oscillator we have with this omega uh, uh, frequency. And as you can notice, this frequency here, the square has this form. Therefore, if the two vortices are very close to the center, this term dominates. So omega square is positive. Therefore, my fixed point is a center. So I'm going to have just orbits that perturb away from this co-rotating state that are just little circles. So again, I'm going to get something similar to what I got before, something that is rotating. And because I just do a perturbation, it's going to be rotating and at the same time doing this uh, uh, little frequency. But if I get closer to the edge of the cloud, this term is going to uh, dominate. And therefore, I'm going to get an imaginary frequency. I'm going to get an instability. So this tells me that as I move away, these two vortices from the center, I'm going to get that this rot co-rotating equilibrium is going to go from stable to unstable at one point. Okay? And you can predict exactly where that happens. And you get this beautiful picture of bifurcation where you have two vortices that are close to each other are always stable. If they are further away from each other, it's still steady state, but it's unstable steady state. That unstable steady state is replaced by two steady states that are asymmetric. So now you have an asymmetric, co-rotating, steady state here. Okay? So now that we understand this picture from the dynamical perspective, I want to go back to the original experiments and see if So this state, it's th th this, this is a Hamiltonian system. So there is no dissipation. So if I just start on stable, I'm going to just get into a messy orbit. But correct. Yes. Well, the thing, this is a saddle point. So out of the saddle point, you will get unstable through the unstable manifold. And very, very small changes on that manifold will give you the very different states. Okay? So I, I cannot really predict what's going to happen because you are through an unstable manifold. What I can predict is that if you are close to these asymmetric states with the right asymmetry, you should be able to see these co-rotating asymmetric states. Okay? So in other words, if I just get 100 different runs from the experimentalists, 
how am I going to see this bifurcation? I will never be able to see a symmetric configuration that has a radius larger than the critical radius. Okay? And we examined all the movies from the experiments, and there was no symmetric state that was larger than the uh, radius that we computed from the theory. So let me show you some of the results. For example, this one, uh, the uh, dashed line is the um, critical radius. And remember, the experimenters cannot exactly set a symmetric configuration. So this is close to a symmetric configuration with a small perturbation. But if this steady state is stable, I'm going to do a wobbling. Remember that I'm always in a co-rotating frame, but I'm going to do a wobbling on a co-rotating frame. Therefore, I should be able to see kind of a rigid body rotation with a small perturbation on top. And every time I measured what was the total angular momentum, I was always seeing these rigid body, rigid body rotations when the angular momentum was lower than the critical value. On the contrary, if you have that the radii are above the critical, critical radius, you don't get any more a rigid body rotation. One will go much faster than the other. They will overtake each other. In fact, you can th this analysis is not restric restricted to two. I could do it with three. And the same, you have this equilateral triangle configuration that it's uh, stable up to a critical radius. The critical radius is smaller than the critical radius for two vortices. Uh, there are some asymmetric triangular configurations that are stable after this bifurcation. And you can play the same trick with four. And this is not just Matsy stuff. You can actually see this in the experiments. So out of all the movies, the ones that had kind of triangular configurations where none of the vortices overtook any of the other ones is like having a three orbit with a little bit of perturbation on a corrotating frame were always inside the critical radius, also with four. So this is a highly perturbed four quadrangular configuration, but still because I'm below the radius, it's stable. So it's a highly uh, per perturbed, stable stationary state in a corrotating frame. But whenever one of these vortices was above the critical radius, then the order of the vortices just went bananas and you did not have any more a rigid body rotation. So we had a really beautiful match of all the experiments uh, uh, by categorizing them between the, uh, the thresholds and it worked uh, pretty nicely. No, 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 no. Uh, Remember, this, the, I'm, I'm doing here a, a, a kind of a toy model the way you did. The, the vortices are not going to disappear. In fact, you can have theorems depending on how close you start. You will never get closer than a certain distance, otherwise you will violate certain energy. So you don't have annihilations or anything. The vortices there is just you do not have a nice stationary state that is stable. So you start with one and then they're just going to do some funky dance, not chaotic either. Well, with three and four, you can get chaotic, but with two, it's just a funky dance that is basically just a quasi-periodic orbit on the wrong uh, corrotating frame. And with three or four, you get the full enchilada, whatever you want, uh, uh, chaos and whatnot. All right? Okay. This is all vortices of the same size, yes. And the way they did it in the experiment, they still used the kibble durek mechanism, but before they actually quenched, they did uh, they, uh, make the trap a little bit elliptical, and they imprint a certain angular momentum, and then they do the quenching. That way, they can kind of control how many vortices. It was not 100% certain. Sometimes they didn't get it exactly right, but they could control anything between 1 and 11 vortices at will depending on how much angular momentum they put into the system when they were doing the quenching. Yeah. Okay, vor vor like higher circulation. Th the thing is in the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, the GPE equation, without any trapping, vortices of, of charge higher than one are actually unstable. So I was going to comment that in your talk, and maybe we can talk a little bit about later. But you can have this cute idea or have this vortex ring beha behind your, uh, your particle, but those guys are going to be unstable. So they're going to break up into single charge. Okay. 
but, but they have to be transient because intrinsically a vortex of charge two will actually split into two vortices of charge one. That's why I'm not considering high order vortices because they are typically not stable in experiments. Yeah. All right. <coughs> Because of the trap, Remember, I don't know if you put, he said, uh, the, better attention, but when I said if you, if, you, if you have a flat background, they're unstable, you can stabilize a higher charge with the trapping. I mean, if you put a very, very tight trap, you stay there and then you stabilize them. But typically, if they're in free space, they're going to be unstable. Yeah. How much time do I have? Eight minutes. Okay. So fasten your seat belts because I'm not now going to go to 3D. And the roller coaster is going to be three-dimensional. All right. So um, in both uh, experiments, you can see now vortex rings. For example, they can be produced by instabilities. You have a dark solid point wall that can de de decay onto uh, vortex rings, or you can create them by uh, all, all sorts of techniques. I'm going to skip uh, all that stuff. But uh, something nice that you can do with the equations, as we mentioned before, and some of the talk has mentioned before, if you go to the Madelung transformation, you can basically cast the GPE equation into a non-viscous Eulerian fluid, provided you are far away from the vortex course, where the quantum pressure term is basically negligible. So effectively, if you're far away from vortex core, you can use the beautiful Joseph Art and all that, those tools that we have available. And for example, uh, we could try to describe some sort of behavior of two vortex rings, like this one. This is called the leapfrogging behavior. So if you use the Biosavar uh, law for two vortex rings, each one at position Z1 and Z2, H1 with this radius R1 and R2, you can actually set up an equation of motion so actually, even Luca mentioned that, that there were some nasty uh, elliptic integrals. So the equations of motion are really nice and cute and compact. So it's just this is the linear motion due to each vortex having its own intrinsic velocity. And there is some sort of coupling between the Z and the Rs with this coupling kind of potential. The coupling potential is the one that gets a little bit nasty. But if you can deal with those uh, uh, integrals or just hide them under the rug, you have a very beautiful dynamical system. Now the question will be, have these reduced equation of motion, how do they compare with the actual uh, three-dimensional GPE simulations? These are the comparison. So each one of these uh, closed orbits is one leapfrogging, just have different uh, radii between the leapfrog, and I'm placing myself in a Comorian reference frame. So in the Comorian reference frame, I have just closed loops, and you can see that there is a very nice match between the ODE and the PDE. The issue here that I want to kind of bring out is that for certain configurations, I don't have to do the full 3D or the full 2D GPE. I can take a lot of juice out of these particle reductions, all right? So that's kind of the hope, to try to do as much of reductions instead of just throwing the kitchen sink at the uh, GPE in 3D with um, numerical techniques. Uh, you can actually do this leapfrogging as Carlo has, uh, some of the students have done this with a three, with five, with seven, although they become highly unstable. So you start them and they just break up for three, put <laughs> onto 91. Okay. <coughs> um, so le let me just give you the gist because I don't have time to go too much on the details and I don't have too much details in the, in the, in, 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 in the talk anyway. But uh, in the trap, you can actually set up now vortex rings. And in the same case as we did before, you can have terms that are intrinsic to the ring, terms that are ring to trap um, coupling. So you can have steady state that are like this burger here, so just a single vortex ring. Or you can have a plus and a minus vortex ring that are stable, so that are stationary steady states inside the trap. Depending on the frequency, if you have an oblate or a long trap, you can have that these states could be stable or unstable. If you choose the right trapping strength, in this case, a, a, the same trapping strength in the x, y, and z directions, 
you can actually have the same type of scenario as for the 2D case. I have a steady state, the one I showed you before. What happens if you perturb? Well, the ring is just going to go and do this kind of periodic motion. You can predict the periodic motion, the frequency of the periodic motion, and there is a very nice match between the ODE and the PDE reduction. You can do the trick with one vortex ring, or you can just have two vortex rings, a plus and a minus, and so they're going to oscillate. One is going to oscillate like this, and the other one is going to oscillate in the other direction. And again, you have a very nice match between the ODE and the PDE. Um, I think I'm going to skip this in the interest of time, but we have, just to mention that we have also tried to describe from a particle perspective what happens with certain scattering scenarios. And I'm going to also skip the numerics. Um, maybe I'm going to just mention this, uh, because this might be interesting to some of you guys. Um, I've seen some of the numerics you've done that sometimes if you want an infinite domain, what you do is just do periodic boundary conditions and you hope that whatever disappears on one end and reappears on the other end uh, is not going to affect you or that your box is large enough so that things do not affect you. There is a technique that one of my PhD students, Ron Kaplan, designed. It's what we dubbed a mod square Dirichlet boundary condition. The problem is that if you want to solve the GPE, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, with uh, in the repulsive case, on an infinite domain, you have basically that the background doesn't go to zero. So the question is, what do you use as boundary conditions? You have the chemical potential in your equation. So you have always a term of e to the minus i mu t. So the real and imaginary parts at infinity are always rotating in, 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 in the complex plane. Therefore, you cannot set just Dirichlet boundary conditions on the real part, on the imaginary part. What you want to do is set Dirichlet boundary conditions on the density. That's the only thing that is constant at infinity, the density. But density is not the variable that you're integrating. You're integrating a complex equation with a real part and imaginary part. So what you can do is cook up this method where you assume that the uh, uh, wave function has a constant background density at infinity and you can f uh, formulate this as a boundary condition problem. And just to convince you how it works, let me just show you a movie of what happens here. Can I switch back? Can I slow it down? So this is the whole domain. It's not that I'm showing you just a little bit a part of a large domain. So you can see that what I'm integrating here, a dark soliton that is moving to the right, and this is the real and imaginary part, the red and the blue, and you see that it's kind of transparent. It's like going out. I don't know if you feel this, but th this is really tough. Doing transparent boundary conditions involves doing a integral differential equation at the boundaries. It's a real nightmare. Here, with a very, very nice, beautiful description I'm going to just put again in the board, you can see that I can simulate a basically a transparent boundary condition where the real imaginary part, uh, parts adjust themselves at the boundary while keeping the density just to be constant. This mod squared Dirichlet boundary condition. Well, with this, this, on this is kind of momentum. The vortex is, sorry, the dark solid is actually going to the right. So, yes. But when it will reach the value, no. Because you are violating the fact that mod squared Dirichlet is, is violated. I want the, 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 the density to be constant. If the vortex or the dark solid approaches the boundary, you don't have a constant density. So you still cannot have these guys to touch the boundaries. But you can turn around by using dissipation, and when you have dissipation at the boundaries, you can couple mod square Dirichlet boundary conditions with dissipation, and then have vortices, or in this case in 3D vortex rings, to be shrinking at uh, close to the boundaries and disappearing. So there is a way to even get around when these disks touch the boundary. It's a good question. I, I, I don't know, because that will be also natural, right, Neumann? Yes, it's a constant. No, if, 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 the, if the wave function decays to zero in, a bright, in the bright case, then I don't have a problem. If it's zero, I can put any condition that you want. The problem here is that it's non-zero boundary conditions. All right, so with that, I just uh, 
the small recap is this beautiful approach when you have a complicated partial differential equation in two or three dimensions, you do a little bit of math, a little bit of energy, a little bit of particle reduction, you get a much, much more reduced dynamical system where you can get a lot of insight on the original problem, but do not forget to go back to the original GPE and the experiments to actually do a match, something that worked uh, pretty well here. Okay, thank you for your attention. <laughs>